I, uh, I, I spent a good portion of last night being highly autistic. I was looking up some stuff in like the Aztecs and the Mayans to learn a little bit more about Mesoamerican aesthetics. There was so much interesting shit. First of all, what's with your hair? I had a hat on. Just it, give it a minute. I, I'm out of the shower. I've always kind of conflated the Aztecs and the Mayans, but they're totally different. I feel so racist now. First of all, the Aztecs were in Mexico, and the Mayans were more like Central America. And also, the Aztecs were at their height back in the 16th century. The Mayans were like BC era. Like, totally different. They're just like the two big Mesoamerican civilizations that everyone knows about. So I just thought they were kind of like next to each other. Okay, you know how there are a bunch of stereotypes about like the Mesoamericans? Because I, I was looking through and I was thinking like, okay, these aren't true, right? So I look up the Mayans and it's like, oh, the Mayans were like super cool about calendars and math and astronomy. Uh, and they were like really inventive with medicine and they built like incredible like architectural that stuff. And they're like, okay, what about the Aztecs? And it's like, okay, so the Aztecs really loved war and killing people and they liked blood. They liked fighting and they liked it when war led to them killing people and producing blood through fighting. And it's like, <laughs> oh. Okay. All right. So humans? Uh, uh, the Aztecs took it a bit farther. Yeah. <laughs> they were they were very yeah, they were they were I mean they were literally blood for the blood godding. What about the Incas then? That's not Mesoamerican, that's South American and uh they were cool. They were super cool. Well, the uh, 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 Jean-Paul Quiller, the, the Mayans have been around for like ages, but at the height, like w the stuff we attribute to the Mayans as a distinct civilization is, is, is a lot older. But a lot of the Mayan ethnic groups that were around like two and a half thousand years ago are still around today. Interestingly, despite colonization, there are portions of the former Mayan civilization and ethnic groups from them that literally are directly like one to one today. Like it's the same ethnic group. Uh, with the same languages and like cultural shit and stuff, which is uh, which is pretty wild. Cortez won because everyone in Mexico hated the Aztecs. Yeah, literally, the Aztecs were insane. The Aztecs literally had days in their calendar where they were like, "It's fucking war day. Let's do a fucking war," and they would just find a nearby like civilization and just war day, war day, and they they would just fucking. They would just do that. Um, and they would constantly fight with all of their neighbors. They would just do it for literally for fun. It was it was part of their fucking civilization. So when Cortez came around and the Spanish conquistadors, they were able to leverage everyone else's fucking hatred of the Aztecs. Um, there was never a real like war between the Spanish and the Aztecs. It was like the all the neighbors of the Aztecs like saw the tides turning and things got worse and worse for the Aztecs. Then there was smallpox. Also, apparently Cortez held their king hostage for a year. It was a whole thing. Uh, yeah. And then the smallpox came. Were the Aztecs the ones who said 2012 was the apocalypse? No, that was the Mayans. The Mayans loved calendar making. Listen, the Mayans loved calendars because they were cool and mathematic because the Mayans were autistic. The Aztecs liked calendars because every once in a while it would be war day, war day, <laughs> and they would go get to do a war. Every in, in Aztec society, every time a boy was born, they would bury its umbilical cord with a shield and an arrow as a way of signifying to the gods it like a new soldier has entered the, the world. They started getting trained in warfare at 15. They would literally, this is not a joke. They would literally, depending on how many captives they got, not kills, captives, how many living enemies they brought back, they liked their sacrifices, they would give you more clothing and cooler clothing. You would get like a cape on your first capture. On your second capture, you would earn the honor of wearing sandals on the battlefield. Initiates have to wear, uh, they have to go like make it through the jungle barefoot, like character building. And if you have like four captives, you get like this giant plumed fucking hat. Yeah, it's like, it's, it, this is like, return to tradition, right? Like, can you imagine going to a U.S. military base in Iraq, and you see some guy with a giant plumed feather hat, and it's like, oh yeah, that guy killed like four insurgents the other day, you know, and he's just got a giant hat, and like, 
he can just walk by and make you suck his dick. That was literally just Aztec society. Okay, one one other thing, one other thing, okay? This is so fucking dope, okay? So I, I learned a lot about um, how Aztec like warfare developed, right? Because there were a bunch of differences uh, between how European war and Aztec war developed. First of all, the Aztecs were like big. They fielded armies of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, Tenochtitlan was for a time one of the largest cities in the world. It was bigger than London in the 16th century. Arguably, at its height, it was larger than almost any city uh, in Europe, apart from maybe Constantinople and Naples. So Tenochtitlan was huge. I mean, it was it, it, and well developed. There were like writings on Spanish conquistadors writing back to their king, and they were like, "This place is really cool. Can we not burn it?" <laughs> but but um, anyway, anyway. So I was learning about their weaponry and stuff, and um, because you know I want to know what's a model in 3D, and they never got iron. They they never got they just they never got iron for for a variety of reasons. Um, they had copper. Copper's like kind of shit for weapons, and, uh, you know. But the big thing they had, their big thing, okay, was there were a lot of volcanically active regions in the area. So they would use obsidian. They would use volcanic glass, which can be sharpened to be just as sharp as a razor. Like you can sharpen obsidian to be sharper than how sharp you could make like iron at the time, because molecularly obsidian just like just like it, it, it fractures at a sharp point or at a, at a blade, you know? And uh, most of the, you know, like most Aztec warriors, you know, you have like axes and you have uh, 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 spear throwers and darts and you have bows and arrows and slings and, you know, a lot of stuff like that. Okay, but the signature Aztec weapon, and I've seen this before in my life and I always thought this was bullshit, okay? The signature Aztec weapon, the Maqua Huitl? Or something like that is this and it's literally like a cricket bat with obsidian blades that have been stuck into the side so that it basically turns into a gigantic fucking like cleaver all the all the obsidian blades are razor sharp at the edge and when i first saw this like like when i was like 12 or something like reading through like ancient weaponry or whatever or not ancient you know but like pre-modern uh, i thought this is fake this isn't a real thing it turns out it was a real thing and these were given to the cadres. These things were made in the image of their gods and given to their greatest warriors. Which means that if you were fighting the Aztecs and you saw one of these guys, that was the boss battle. They would have the plumed hat. They would have the fucking jaguar skin. They would have the sandals. And they would have the giant, like, one and a half meter long razor sharp battle axe. And, and literally, that's not, it's not, it's not even a fucking meme because in Europe, the fancy ceremonial weapons were swords and they were held by noblemen, but noblemen weren't at the front lines of a fight. The cadres were. So in, in Aztec warfare, as, as God intended, you know, the strongest, most badass dudes would actually have the biggest weapons and they would be at the front and they would be the boss battle. Oh my God. Anyway, it's just, it's just really sick, you know. A Spanish conquistador claimed that a swing from these things could decapitate a horse. Which, considering their size, is not entirely impossible. Some of these got to be two meters long. You also have to consider, like, I guess, like, the, the, the warfare logistics at the time. Because the Aztecs didn't really wear armor, right? Like, they had leather skins and stuff, and this motherfucker is wearing, like, some kind of eagle hat head thing but they didn't really have like metal armor you know the way that a lot of european armies would have had at least like some like plate metal on them which makes me wonder if aztec battlefields were literally just like these guys were just cleaving people i mean if you can decapitate a horse you can cut a man in half like you couldn't do it to the conquistadors because they had metal armor but if they weren't i, I just think jesus yeah, they were like chainsaws without the rev. Seriously, though. And on a side note, they were beautiful. Because the big flat wooden face gave you so much space for ornamentation. And they were all made in like the image of their main god or something. Like the, this weapon was like the sacred like god blessing of their god. Yeah, it's really dope. Oh, that's dope, I'm a cognizant. Aztecs had cotton woven armor that was light and could catch arrows. It was so effective the Spaniards started to use it because it, um, it was too hot for plate armor. Yeah, imagine wearing plate armor in like Mexico. Because Tenochtitlan is built over where Mexico City is today. That would suck. I read this passage from a conquistador who, who essentially wrote like, 
they, I think they were writing back to their Spanish king, and they were essentially saying, um, you must believe me as if you were here. There are wonders in this place that would be magnificent even when placed against our own in the homeland. Uh, like, like essentially saying, like, they're not just, the, the shit here isn't just cool for native savages. It's like cool, period. Like, for, like, oh, like, for everyone. Yeah, the Venice of the New World. Fucking wild. They did all this, uh, in between them killing a bunch of people. That's pretty impressive. Anyway, 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 sorry. Learned a lot of interesting stuff. Oh, one last interesting bit that I learned, then we get to Iran. I, I learned a little bit about the, about the Incans as well, which was more like South American than Mesoamerican, but it's good to know, right? Okay, I learned some interesting stuff. You guys ever heard of race science? Uh, it turns out it was right for once. See, uh, the Incans, along with uh, the Tibetans, and I think the Ethiopians, are one of the very, 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 very few examples we have of real divergent human evolution. Because the Incan civilization existed on mountaintops, like multiple kilometers above sea level, like a lot. And as a, as a, pro like if we lived there for a long time, like if I went up there, I would eventually die, but they haven't. It's because not only is their blood that much better at processing oxygen, it's got like way more of the shit that it needs to do that, but their lung capacity is 35% larger on average. They have like a wider rib cage. How fucking wild is that? It's actual human divergent evolution. 35% greater lung capacity on average. That is insane. That is such a massive difference. Because we, we would just die up there. Now you wouldn't, you're way overstating it. No, 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 I read up in it. Like given a long enough time up there, like I would suffer a number of diseases um, from, from like, like a lack of oxygen. Like it would, it would fuck with me. Like it would, it wouldn't kill me instantly, but like I could not live where the Incans live. You could visit for like a day. You're talking within like months or years. I'm saying that civilizationally, my race is not capable of existing where the Incans have. Like, regardless of like individual attainment or like you can train for it or whatever, like, like biologically, I'm not designed to live there. You're overstating? No, this is what I read. Wait, ah, uh, um, um, hold on. Wikipedia, Incan, height, Adaptation. How did none of that make it into the search bar? Reading on the internet? It was Wikipedia. Yeah, look. High altitude adaptation. Those of Tibet and Asia, the Andes of the Americas and Ethiopia and Africa, the, uh, acquired the ability to survive at altitudes above two and a half kilometers. This adaptation means irreversible long-term physiological responses to high altitude environments associated with hereditary behavioral and genetic changes. While the rest of the human population would suffer serious health consequences, the indigenous inhabitants of these regions thrive well in the highest parts of the world. These people have undergone extensive physiological and genetic changes, particularly in the regulatory systems of oxygen respiration and blood circulation, when compared to the lowland population. Um, about 81 million people, about 1% of the world's population, live permanently at altitudes above 8,200 feet, putting these populations at risk for chronic mountain sickness. However, these high, popu high altitude populations have done so for millennia without complications. This special adaptation is now recognized as an example of natural selection in action. The adaptation of the Tibetans is the fastest known example of human evolution, as it's estimated to have occurred any time around 1000 to 7000 BCE. How dope is that? Wouldn't this work both ways? If they lived where we lived, wouldn't they suffer? No, I think they can live where we live. I'm sure there's an evolutionary trade-off somewhere, like maybe they need more calories, or there's something. Like, there's always a trade-off. So they would probably, if they lived at our altitudes, w suffer maybe some minor thing, but I think they're mostly fine. Oh, they're smaller, that's right, they're shorter. Uh, people at higher elevations are shorter. That's wild, Annie. Their hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobin concentration is higher compared to the lowlander population. Would this mean they're genetically better than us? Well, certainly in this fashion. Bash, the Bajau people can hold their breath the longest out of anyone over 10 minutes. That is so fucking cool. Increased oxygen level in their hemoglobin. More oxygen in each red blood cell. This enables them to overcome hypoxia. Yeah, just build different, you know. I think, I mean, this is, isn't this one of the reasons why the, the Incans weren't colonized the same way? South Sudanese are tall, though. Maybe it's not, like, short. There's something. There's always something evolutionarily. You're always trading something for something. Oh, look. 
Though the physical growth in body size is delayed, growth in lung volumes is accelerated. And then we have the Ethiopians. Wasn't this one of the reasons they were able to resist colonization? From the Italians, right? Because the Italians had to hike their shit. It's like, yep, let's, all right, the time to walk up th this five trillion mile long. And they had machine guns. Yeah, those are heavy. That is so interesting. Didn't Ethiopians settle on the hills? I mean, it says right here. The people of the Ethiopian highlands live at extremely high altitudes, around 3,000 meters. That's really fucking high up. That's really, really, really high up. God damn. Yeah, not everyone in Ethiopia lives in the highlands. Ethiopians are really good at track because of this. Yeah, isn't, isn't, yeah, isn't that a thing? It's like it has to do with, like, oxygen acquisition. No, Bosch, anyone born and raised at high altitude developed this trait? No, 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 no. There are two different things here, non-anarchist noble. An individual can train to live uh, healthily on, at high altitudes. They don't have to train. They're built, di they're built differently. So, like, if you, if you wanted to, you could train to live at a high altitude. Probably, if you're healthy. But that's not a thing for them. That's just their default state. So, so for them, it's an evolutionary difference. For us, it would be like a training thing. Artemy is blocking the light back there. He's literally just sitting in front of the light. He's literally absorbing all of the pink light from this light. They love the light. He loves absorbing the light. He's growing stronger. He has found a toy, and it is now stuck to his claws. He is content. Okay, sorry. Oh, but I didn't even finish the thing that I was going to say. The, um, the, uh, the Incans, who, uh, uh, um, who were a million billion miles up, okay? The Incans had a very... Okay, you guys know about Machu Picchu? All of the Incan architecture was made more impressive for the fact that it was built really high up, you know? Like, it's, that's the reason why Machu Picchu is a wonder of the world. Because it's a million years old. And logistically, like, imagine... Imagine, like, getting stone blocks and bringing them here. Like, it's like, it's like all right, we're going to build a citadel, okay? It's going to be on top of a hill, which is a classic, all right? Now, now simply lift these 10,000 tons of stone up the mountain. Do it. But they, they, had, they, had a really, um, they had a really interesting construction technique, okay? So I'm about to show you some dope-ass shit, okay? These are stone blocks made by the Incans. They didn't use mortar. There is nothing uh, adhering these blocks to each other except for gravity. It was said that they could fit these blocks together so well you could not slip a knife between the stones. You know how they did it? You know how they did IRL Minecraft? So what they would do is they would carve a bunch of stone cubes, you know, and they would lay it on the ground on the first level. And then they would start carving the second layer and lay it on top. But before laying it on top, they would spread a layer of dust on top of the first row of blocks, then set down the second row, then lift them up again. And wherever the dust was compressed, that was where there was a point of contact. And then they would use tools to file down that part of the top of the lower set of blocks. And after doing this over and over again, eventually every single block would fit to its bottom part like a jigsaw piece perfectly, thousands of tiny indentations that would fit into each other. Uh, the fa so they didn't need mortar, uh, and it was so uh, such a perfect fit that it was essentially um, earthquake-proof, because without mortar, all of these stone blocks, if agitated from an earthquake, could sort of rustle, but they would never fall, because they were so perfectly fitted that it was just like... Uh, like shaking a container of like uh, like like puzzle pieces that that has no room inside of it, you know. You can move everything inside the block, but the puzzle stays intact. There's no room for it to disassemble. And not only would they do this with like 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 cubic blocks, they would use this technique on any shape. So you have like what I think might be the world's only example of non-mortared, irregular block shapes used to form walls that have survived centuries because of the technique that they would use which is really dope. They did this everywhere. This was like their main thing. Um, just these colossal, massive blocks that is, just have been around forever. Are we sure they weren't actual dwarves? They could have been hill dwarves. They were short, uh, and they were at high elevations. This is possible. Look, like the, uh, uh, one of these, I think it's called the 12-sided, the 12-angled stone is actually considered a uh, relic in, in, in like an Incan... Um, museum because this thing is huge by the way because it's so irregular 
and it fit perfectly before the structure it was a part of eventually came apart. Um, but it's it's like an example of like the the fine precision here. We're talking like like fractions of a millimeter of of precision on stone blocks larger than a human. How do they do the dust thing on the vertical sides? Um, I think I think it's they mostly do it um, on the underside and top side. As for the vertical side, I think they mostly just rely on a, on sliding force, which might be one of the reasons they have these irregular shapes because that way it makes it like impossible for stuff to just kind of like slide apart. You know, like th this isn't moving. How'd they do the measurements? They didn't. Uh, they didn't do the measurements. Uh, their their system. Well, I mean, they had measurements, of course, but like this, it was it was just done by filing down the top and bottom surfaces of the stone blocks based on whether or not they would leave indentations and layers of dust. Really wild stuff, you know. Uh, funnily enough, the Aztecs were the ones who didn't actually have measurements. <laughs> the Aztecs were so war focused; they never had standardized measurements. They would use people's body parts, like this is a wingspan, this is uh, this is an arm's length, you know. They, like that that was what they did and somehow they still built Tenochtitlan so you know whatever i mean clearly they were, they were doing just fine but no the the incans were were quite developed the mayans fucking loved math so whatever anyway i just think it's important to learn about stuff like this because i feel like especially from a western perspective even if you're a progressive it's really easy to just kind of think like oh yeah there were like the oppressed indigenous people and then like the west came and like ruined everything but i feel like once you actually get into it it's like there's there's a lot of really cool it's just interesting because it's totally diver it's it's like architectural evolution. This just doesn't exist in Europe. This kind of like stone facing. Anyway, sorry for the divergence. I've really been trying to make an effort to learn a little bit more about about the history of civilizations we don't know that much about because I feel like it's uh informative. The Incans were able to do this because of potatoes which can be dried and preserved for decades and can grow with little water. The Incans had a command economy with a near drought proof logistics chain. They had stockpiles of weapons and dried potatoes. Fuck yeah, dude. Return to tradition. Bosh, no, that's wrong. I'm just reading the chatter, right? But I believe them wholeheartedly. Inca had fa crazy food infrastructure too, maintained with a labor tax, paid with like a few weeks of one person's labor per year per family. Yeah, I saw that too. Again, I, I guess it was just really funny when I saw that like all the fucking stereotypes for the Aztecs were right and for the others were wrong. Have you seen that they used wheels only for toys? Because why would you use wheels on mountains? Yeah, the Incans never used wheels. They moved these stone blocks that weighed multiple tons without using wheels because their terrain was inhospitable to wheels. But the Aztecs were, were legitimately in, fucking insane, so, you know. If you look up Inca mountains, all you get is Machu Picchu. That's like the only thing that you can see. I'm trying to see if I can find like a non-Machu Picchu. Literally, you, you, it's just like Machu Picchu, you know, I guess. but. Like, you can kind of understand why. Because I've, I've seen, like, white supremacists gloat, like, the Incans never invented wheels. They could have. They used them for toys. They didn't use them for anything else, because why the fuck would you need wheels here to move the heavy-ass rocks? But the wheels wouldn't do much. Look at the mountains they had to traverse. And yeah, what would even pull that? Yeah, llamas? They didn't even have, like, pack animals. No oxen, yeah. That's always been one of the most convincing explanations for me, the one that CGP Grey put out. Well, he didn't invent it, whatever, but, like, he did videos on it. How, like, one of the big civilizational differences, one of the big, like, easy versus hard starting locations it, for, for, for civilization was just, like, do you have useful animals nearby that you can domesticate? Like, that's, that's a convincing explanation. I mean, it makes sense, you know. It's a useful, useful metric there. To be fair, they had animals, just different ones. Yeah, but llamas are not as useful as horses. Uh, like, horses, cows, chickens, like, the, like, the, the, the Afro-Eurasian continent does have a lot of extremely useful domesticatable animals. Yeah, llamas are stubborn, aren't they? Horses aren't very useful in a mountain. Well, that's true, that's true. But, I, you know, a mountain in general is a pretty difficult um, environment to do civilization stuff. Difficult environment to, uh, you know, build big wacky stuff. I got spat on by an alpaca while I worked in a zoo. I fucking hate them. <laughs> Yeah, where are the war goats? Why why aren't there like six foot tall mountain goats that would just like bring Incan warriors from the bottom of the mountain range to the top in like three seconds, you know? That'd be dope. I want to learn more about the Incan civilization. I guess, look at this. Incan trail permits. Look at this. Look at this. Man, now I just want to visit. Well, not like I could hike to this. You have to be pretty fucking healthy to hike up here. It's just insane. How do you even do agriculture up here? You know what you need for agriculture? 
You need um you need consistent running water. How can you guarantee that when you're at the top of the mountains? No, I know they use terraces, but like you're supposed to divert water to irrigate your crops, but water runs downhill from mountains. You're at the mountains. It's all like rainfall dependent, I guess. Fuck. Pretty sure there are hiking trips up there. Okay, okay, fine. You, I'll survive. Do you think living up here would make you more or less afraid of heights? If you had a, like a fear of heights and you lived up here, you'd just kill yourself, right? Like what? The Spanish kept having miscarriages after conquering the Inca because the elevation was too high for Spanish women to birth. Yeah, yeah, I read about that. The, the Spanish eventually abandoned these territories because they tried to colonize it and they would just miscarriage over and over because the pregnant women didn't get enough oxygen. This is what I mean by like, you can train to live up here, but genetically we couldn't live up here. That's what I mean. Like, even if an individual human can, can get strong enough to survive up here, like we're not supposed to be up here. The Incans were, the Incans could be up here. The Inca built massive net complexes that could catch and condense water. What? That can't be real. That's too cool to be real. Incan aqueducts. The Incan aqueducts refer to any series of aqueducts but the Incan people. The Inca built structures to increase arable land, provide drinking water best. Due to water scarcity and the, in the Indian region, advanced water management was necessary for the Incan to thrive and expand among the coast of Peru. Such structures, some of which survive today, show the advanced hydraulic and civil engineering capabilities of the Inca. The water came mostly from nearby rivers, also brought down from freshwater springs and mountains. The ancients discovered, the ancients discovered, Jesus, that if they diverted certain amounts of water from rivers, they didn't have to worry about scarce rain and drought. They could also stimulate plants to grow faster with water time. Workers dug tunnels through mountains? With what dynamite, motherfucker? What? Actual dwarves, Jesus Christ. That, we've got it, Dwar dwarf pill confirmed. One such explorer was Pedro Cieza de Leon. In his published chronicles detailing his travels through Peru, he noted seeing a large wall as he headed east from Cusco. That's what Cusco from Emperor's New Groove was named after, by the way. That was based on the Incans. Which scholars argue he was referring to the aqueducts at the Picolacta archaeological site. Cieza writes, Along this road, there's a very large, broad wall, along the top of which, according to the natives, ran pipes of water. Wait, pipes? Not a, not a channel? Did they have pipes? No, no, they must have meant channel. Pipes requires metalworking. Or, like, hollowing wood. Wood pipes? Did they bring trees up here? Wooden pipes? Stone pipes exist. Okay, I just, I know a little bit about water management in Europe and, the, like, a post-Columbus America. And, um... Using pipes to run water was not common, like, long after the 16th century. What? Yeah. Well, aqueducts run water through channels, and oh my god. What the fuck? Dude, the good timeline was where the Incans survived. Holy shit, they were stone. They just, with hand tools, bore pipes through stone some of this shit is gorgeous i wish this wasn't a low-res photo look at the look at the uh, beveling on this stone here look at that god damn this is uh this is a pipe look there's uh it's it's covered on the top this is a pipe not a channel the inca built bridges out of ropes yeah i mean what else are you going to up there right the mountain winds are probably pretty treacherous so this would have been built like 500 years ago that's a pretty good-looking bridge for holding up for 500 years, considering the materials they had. Bosh, the Incans are incredible, yes, but to bring it back down a little, you realize they did all this long after the Roman Empire built their cities? Y yeah? It's not a, a race. Um, just keep in mind that after the Roman Empire built their cities, like, there was still thousands of years of, like, European shitpile villages. Human civilization doesn't really, like, linearly develop in that fashion, you know? Empires acquire resources and are able to, like, gussy up their preferred areas, but uh, it's, it's, it's always more complicated how this stuff evolves. It's mostly about challenging sort of like the, the conception that they were like savages, you know what I mean? Um, whenever we think of like, like Mesoamerican or Latin American, like, natives or whatever, I think the average Westerner, including to an extent myself, frankly, thinks of like people in loincloths. Well, the Aztecs did wear loincloths, you know, but... The, hold on. Frankly, the Aztecs, uh, the, the Aztecs elevated the loincloth. Um, this was Moctezuma, um, the emperor of the Aztecs, when the Spaniards arrived. And frankly, you know what? Okay, I'm, I'm loincloth pilled. Yeah. Why are we making fun of loincloths again? Yeah, uh, like, it's just funny because, like, all of our European nobles were, like, pale, fat, pasty pieces of shit who were, like, inbred to fuck. 
And then it's like, but of course, obviously, the Aztecs are led by a warrior king. Obviously. So, you know, he's, he's, he's like a fucking muscly dude, just chilling with his abs hanging out. It's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, you're chosen by the gods. I believe you. Like, who here is more of a Giga Chad? Like, this literally looks like a virgin versus Chad image, this painting of the meeting between Moctezuma and, like, Cortez, right? Like, you have Cortez in his, like, gay bitch armor, where he's so afraid of getting hit by an arrow. And then over here, you have the practically naked fucking... <laughs> Look at that! Like, Jesus Christ! The Conquistadors also smelled like shit, according to accounts. Yeah. A mixed relationship with bathing. Apparently, when the Spaniards arrived at the New World, the Aztecs towered over them. I think they were supposed to be pretty big, yeah. This is just really cool. Look at this. This is the Incans as well. Look, they had an altar with baths around it, and the baths had water channels that would run through to it. Okay, the person in chat who mentioned it earlier wasn't full of shit. Fog collectors. The first man-made fog collectors stretched back this far as the Incan Empire, where buckets were placed under trees to take advantage of condensation. Okay, I see. Um... So that was like first step. That's dope. I wonder if they I wonder if they understood what was happening, right? Like there's no way the Incans would have known like, oh yeah, the air has ambient moisture that condenses. Like do, do you think they thought just like, oh, the, will the gods just like add water to trees or like leaves exude water or something? It's got to be something like that, right? No, they knew. No, I don't I don't think they could have known. They they wouldn't have had like chemistry knowledge. Not not like, yeah. Here's the water and soil answer issued 3 and 4. Food security. This is so interesting. In the Andes, high cool elevation, scarcity of flat land, and climatic uncertainty were major factors influencing farmers. Or crop yield. The vertical archipelago. What? Oh, okay. It's it's a sociological term. Okay. Placed great emphasis on storing agricultural products at every major center of their empire and along their extensive road system. Hillside placements were used to preserve food and storage by utilizing the naturally cool air and wind to ventilate both room and floor areas. Drainage canals and gravel floors in Colcas helped keep food stuff dry. Food could be stored for up to two years in these granaries before spoiling due to ventilation. And drainage. Dried meat, freeze-dried potatoes, maize, and quinoa were among the crops stored in large quantities. I read this too. You know how they kept their records? They kept them in fucking knotted ropes. That was how they kept numerical records. And it was actually good because a knotted rope is very easy to store and it's essentially indestructible. Whereas a stone tablet, uh, so whereas like a stone tablet, like you record it and it's like on stone so it can break or erode and it's really fucking heavy. Like you can store an enormous amount of mathematical information uh, just with, with, with the, 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 the ropes. Or an abacus? No, no, no. The point was storing it. Like, like you could literally store architectural information on a building in the building for hundreds of years with no change in the recording system. Like, like you can literally have a small box that contains all of the info on the construction of, of a citadel or something like that for future architects to like maintain or redevelop or fix or repair. And you could just store it like with no space, no weight, it could be easily... Uh, transcribed or moved. How do you store that? It feels weird. You, you tie uh, the knots uh, in, in the rope in the distance between the knots. The uh, kripu are recording devices fashioned. Like, look at this. It was like, it was like this. It was like this whole, like, to us, this is nothing. To them, this is like the matrix code. Like, they, they look at this and it's like, oh yeah, of course. Doesn't rope rot? It depends on the material, but this is like hundreds of years old. It's Pretty. This is how they transported uh, Kikus. Look at this. The Chaskis were messengers of the Incan Empire. Agile, highly trained, and physically fit. They were in charge of carrying the Kipus, messages, and gifts. You can transport them up to 240 kilometers per day through the Chaskis relay system. What? They were not just messengers. They were trained to be able to read and translate the Kipus to each other in higher authorities. Not only were they used to transport oral messages, but also helped the Inspector General, the Sapa Inca's brother, keep track of the people of the Empire. Chaskis were chosen from the fittest young men and were known to be the fastest runners. They were dispatched along thousands of kilometers. Tambos, or relay stations, were used for the Chaskis to stop at and transfer messages to the next Chasqui. There were different sizes and levels of Tambo, and each one was assigned a different use. What the fuck? So again, this is what I mean by learning about stuff, right? Because the in, the natural thought might be like, oh, they used ropes to record numbers. How primitive. But it's like, oh, 
what other method could you use to carry over like complex mathematical data in a fashion that won't get damaged, is easy, light, be transported without any difficulty, uh, uh, can be kept and recorded for a long time, um, won't like it mixed around or anything, you know, like, oh, well, this is actually a pretty reasonable solution. And they fucking did it. They built an empire off of it. And you don't have to worry about shitty handwriting. You should look at what Zan said. I didn't see what Zan said. Death Stranding? True! Many of these bridges from five trillion years ago are still intact and can be walked across without fear of them breaking because of how durable they are. There are also many races run these paths. Okay, people are still racing on fucking Incan bridges, I guess. The Incan road system was the most extensive and advanced transportation system in pre-Columbian South America, at least 40,000 kilometers long. And this civilization is just lost. We just don't know anything. Well, we don't know enough. I mean, we see the legacy of the empire, but bet they didn't have potholes. Uh, well, they wouldn't have had like, uh, like heavy carts and horses and stuff. So they might have actually not had to worry that much about maintenance. Oh yeah, water will fuck a trail up. That's totally true. God, colored string too. Making it look pretty. Lost, I think you mean wiped out? Yeah. The Incan Empire only lasted from 1438 to 1532. That is so wild. In, in less than 100 years, they were just like, yeah, 40,000 kilometers of road, let's go. Have they translated any of them? I don't know if, if we have translations on these. Maybe a couple. Oh, wait. Having analyzed several hundred kipos, have shown that most info is numeric and these numbers can be read. Each cluster of knots is a digit, and there are three main types of knots. Oh, the knot type differs. Overhand knots, long knots, and figure eight knots. In Asher's system, a fourth type of knot, a figure eight with an extra twist, is referred to as EE. A number is represented as a sequence of knot clusters in base 10. Powers of 10 are shown by position along the string. Digits in positions of 10 and higher powers are represented by clusters of simple knots. Digits in the one position are represented by long knots. Zero is represented by the absence of a knot in the appropriate direction. Because the ones digit is shown in a distinctive way, it is clear where the number ends. So the number 731 would be represented by 7S3SE. 804 would be 8SX4L. But yeah, they had a fucking zero. They had a fucking zero! We only discovered what zero was like five years ago. Some have argued that far more than numeric information is present in the Kipus are a writing system. Possible reasons for the apparent absence of a written language include destruction by the Spanish of all written records. Yeah, the Spanish, like, destroyed everything. Spanish conquest of the Inca Empire. I mean, it all ends here, right? What's a bigger insult, Spanish or British? Well, the Spanish and British have both had their time being the biggest bastards for colonization. They just did it in different eras, right? Like, when I think Spanish bastards, I think 15th, 16th century, and when I think British bastards, I think, like, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. But it's a tough competition, you know? Let's not forget the French or the Dutch, you know? The French still hold on to a ton of colonial empires. And they killed Sankara. Now the Portuguese as well, yeah. We don't even have that much info on the, the destruction of the Incan Empire. The thing that's most fucked up, though, I, I genuinely can't believe, like, how, like, objectively evil the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire was. I read through this the other day, like, literally at, like, 3 a.m., my eyes glazed over, just thinking, like, like, how Marvel movie can this get? Like, how obvious can the bad guy be, you know? It's important to point out that, like, the Aztecs weren't the good guys. They were actually... the, a the If the Aztec Empire hadn't gotten conquered by the bigger bastards, they probably would be remembered as, as like, evil savages. Which, to be fair, they were pretty fucking evil. They were very bad. Um, they definitely weren't savages. They were very, you know, um, yeah, they were, they were, they were very, uh, you know, developed in their, in their fashion, but... <clears throat> oh, the Aztecs were huge imperialists. Um, and that ended up being their downfall. There's kind of a lesson here, right? The Aztecs were so uh, insistent on warring with their neighbors that when the real bad guys showed up, everyone was divided. The other, um, the other, like, uh, Mesoamerican tribes were, like, eager to ally with these strange armored knights from the sea. Because it could help them bring down the Aztecs. Little did they know what it would bring. The Aztecs were also very Orwellian. At the start of their empire, they burned their own history codices so they could rewrite their own history. God damn. Just, like, listen to some of this, okay? So, I'm skipping a ton of stuff here to the point where they meet with Moctezuma. On November 8th, 1519, after the fall of Cholula, Cortes and his forces entered Tenochtitlan, the island capital of the Mexica Aztecs. 
It is believed the city was one of the largest in the world at that time, and the largest in the Americas up to that point. The most common estimates put the population at around 60,000 to over 300,000 people. If the population of Tenochtitlan was a quarter million in 1519, it would have been larger than every city in Europe except perhaps Naples and Constantinople, and four times the size of Seville. To the Aztecs, Tenochtitlan was the altar for the empire, as well as the city that Quetzalcoatl would eventually return to. So they thought that their fucking god, their main god. So if the Aztecs hadn't been so murder happy, do you think the combined civilizations could have stand a chance against the Spanish? In my personal opinion, having read through this, yes. If the, if there was a united front, I think they would have um they would have been able to beat off the initial. No, no, no. In the long run, they wouldn't have formed a fucking like Mesoamerican other Europe or anything. But at the at the initial like conquistador stage, it was a really risky investment, like Cortez in the initial conquistadors. And apparently one of the reasons they had renewed confidence in their ability to survive in this land is because they were able to ally with the um the tribes that hated Aztecs. So it's more like the the initial weakness in the um no guys, I know about the disease. I'm saying that if there hadn't been like these initial fractures, I, I, I think there's a decent chance the conquistadors would have been like, no, we, we would need like tens of thousands of men to conquer this place. Like, let's fuck off. Uh, they still might have gotten hit with a smallpox plague, but I think it definitely would have like changed the way things played out. Because before smallpox, um, I mean, they had hundreds of thousands of Aztec soldiers, right? Like in a, before disease, in a straight conflict. Um, it, it definitely would have warded them off a bit more. That's just a guess on my part. Anyway. Upon meeting, Herman Cortez claimed to be the representative of the queen, Doña Juana of Castile, and her son, King Carlos I of Castile, and Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, all Spanish royalty, and then made an appearance. Blah, 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 formalities. Um, Sargon reports that Moctezuma welcomed Cortez to Tenochtitlan on the great causeway, Zolac. The chiefs who accompanied Moctezuma were Acama, uh, king of Texcoco, Tetlepanquetzaltin, king of Tlacopan, Itzquahitzin, and Tlacocalcaro, lord of Tlatelolco. <laughs> okay. Moctezuma and his chiefs were adorned with blazing gold on their shoulders with feathers and jewels. On the causeway where the two groups met, enormous numbers of people from Tenochtitlan watched the exchange. Moctezuma went to greet Cortez with his brother, Quitzlahuac, and his nephew, Kakamatsin. Cortez strode ahead of his commanders and attempted to embrace Moctezuma, but was restrained by Quitzlahuac and Kakamatsin. Cortez was not permitted to touch the emperor. No one was allowed. After greetings, Moctezuma personally dressed only Cortez in a priceless featherwork flower, a golden jewelry studded necklace, and a garland of flowers. Moctezuma then brought Cortez to the shrine of the goddess Toki, where he gave him a more private greeting in which he practically gave the Aztec Empire to Cortez, as he reportedly said that it was his desire to serve. A fragment of the greeting of Moctezuma says, My lord, you have become fatigued, you have become tired, to the land you have arrived. You have come to your city, Mexico. Here you have come to sit on your place, on your throne. Oh, it has been reserved to you for a small time. It was conserved by those who have gone, your substitutes. This is what has been told of our rulers, those who governed our city, ruled this city. That you would come to ask for your throne, your place, that you would come here. Come to the land, come and rest, take possession of your royal houses, give food to your body. Moctezuma had the royal palace of Axayacatl. Moctezuma's father prepared for Cortez. It's pronounced Mexico. I'm not going to pronounce this shit correctly. Don't even try. I'm trying my best, but don't try to correct me. On the same day as uh, Moctezuma came to visit Cortez, Spanish Causeway, went on to explain his view of what the Spanish expedition represented in terms of Aztec tradition and lore, including the idea that Cortez and his men were the return of characters from Aztec legend. Was this written by Cortez, though? A lot of this has been disputed, but I think it's well-regarded historical record that there was some kind of religious significance given to the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors, and the conquistadors leveraged that as a way of undermining the empire internally. Like, keep in mind, Moctezuma may have been like a king, but what are royalty if not dumbasses, right? He was like an ultra-religious, zealot, like, warrior king who presided over a warlike empire. Like, we're not talking the height of wisdom here. Listen to this. 
While in the Axiacatl Palace, the conquistadors discovered the secret room where Moctezuma kept the treasure he had inherited from his father. The treasure consisted of a quantity of golden object, jewels and plates and ingots, Diaz noted. The sight of all that wealth dumbfounded me. They found the secret gold room. It's like a fucking video game. Fucking Cortez in 1519. My life is like a video game. You, you like that reference? Thank you. Cortez later asked Moctezuma to allow him to erect a cross and an image of the Virgin Mary next to the two large idols of Huiquebolos and Tezcalipoca. After climbing the 114 steps to the top of the main temple period, uh, pyramid, a central place for religious authority. Moctezuma and his papas were furious at the suggestion, with Moctezuma claiming his idols give us health and rain and crops and weather and all the victories we desire. So apparently, uh, in some of the earlier tribes where the Spanish had arrived, apparently, like, the Spanish were like, hey, have you heard of this guy Jesus Christ? And some of these Mexican tribes were like, Jesus Christ? That sounds like a cool god. And they added Jesus Christ to their pantheon of gods. Like, the, the, this thing literally says, like, it's impossible to know whether these tribes understood Catholicism, the, but they simply added the, <laughs> yeah, they're just like, ah, another, another god to worship. Yeah, Roman behavior right there. Ah, where is that? It's, it's somewhere, it's somewhere here. Here, listen. Legends say he convinced the four leaders of Tlaxcala to become baptized. Max, a bunch of names. Received the names of Don Lorenzo, Don Vicente, Don Bartolome, and Don Gonzalo. It is impossible to know if these leaders understood the Catholic faith. In any case, they apparently had no problem adding the Christian Dios, the Lord of the heavens, to their already complex pantheon of gods. Dude, new god just dropped! Bro! Bro, update! <laughs> new god DLC just dropped! Update, update. That is kind of based. It's very funny, okay? But hold on, hold on, hold on, okay? After Cortez's request surrounding the question of raising the cross and image of Virgin Mary, the Mexica then killed seven Spanish soldiers left on the coast. A lot of complicated stuff happened, okay? But basically, after a couple of the Spanish got killed, listen, Cortez, along with five of his captains, convinced Moctezuma to come quietly with us to our quarters and make no protest. If you cry out or raise any commotion, you will immediately be killed. And then the conquistadors held Moctezuma captive for one year believing the spanish to be envoys of some like 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 aztec prophecy he continued to reign as emperor but the uh, the conquistadors were the ones really in charge because they were essentially holding him hostage and a, a, a ton of the like other aztec leaders were like we should fucking kill the spanish people we should like murder them right now but moctezuma wouldn't allow it <clears throat> moctezuma wouldn't allow it uh because he's the emperor how did they communicate so well um, oh, they, well, they brought, they got translators. I think there were translators on both sides whose job it was to literally just, like, learn the other language. Um, it's complicated. I, I read, like, a bit on it, but it is pretty interesting how they got over that, you know, sort of hump. However, Moctezuma continued to act as emperor, subject to Cortez's overall control. Listen to this. During the period of his imprisonment, Moctezuma stated he was glad to be a prisoner since either our gods gave us power to confine him or Hikibos permitted it. He would even play a game with Cortez. They were forced to take an oath of allegiance to the king of Spain, though Moctezuma could not restrain his tears. Moctezuma was made to pay a tribute to the Spanish king, which included his father's treasure. Listen to this bullshit. These treasures, the Spaniards melted down to form gold bars stamped with an iron die. They melted these ancient Aztec ceremonial golden treasures into ingots that, that's so unfathomably fucking stupid the, even to them they would be worth more as 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 cultural artifacts in their original shape savages savages barely even you <laughs> finally moctezuma let the conquistadors build an altar on their temple next to the aztec idols Finally, the Aztec gods allegedly told the Mexican priests they would not stay unless the Spaniards were killed or driven back across the sea. Or, to translate this, the Mexican priests had had enough and said, hey, God has literally directly told us we need to kill the conquistadors right now. Moctezuma warned Cortes to leave at once as their lives were at risk. Many of the nobility rallied around Quitlahac, um, the brother of Moctezuma and his heir apparent. 
However, most of them could take no overt action against the Spanish unless the order was given by the emperor. And then a bunch of stuff happened. Thousands of more uh, Spaniards arrived. Cortes arrived back to Tenochtitlan later and found that his men had attacked and killed many of the Aztec nobility in the massacre in the Great Temple. And then we have this page has the Aztec account of the incident and the Spaniards account of the incident. Who do you, who do you trust? Oh yeah, they killed a ton of people. The Spaniards said that they were interrupting human sacrifice and the Aztecs said that they wanted their gold. Frankly, I trust the Aztecs on this one. It's not like uh, it's not like Catholics have a problem with human sacrifice. What about witch burnings? Like people get so up in arms about um, Aztec sacrifice. Like Catholics and Christians have done fucking tons of ritualistic sacrifice. They just do it in like a Christian way. They don't sacrifice to the god. They kill in the name of the god. Like that's like okay, wow, you've done it. You've circumnavigated the fucking or circumvented. Sorry, I, I fixed it. Yeah. Killing in the name of... Witch burnings were always controversial in Europe. Okay, like, think of the Crusades. Like, Europeans killed millions of people in the name of their gods, you know? The difference is the Aztecs did it with a fancy knife on top of an altar. I, I just... the, uh, the our, our obsession with, like, demonizing human sacrifice is a purely aesthetic one. Uh, people die in the name of religion all over the place all the time. Europeans have killed so many people in the name of religion. So often, in huge numbers. Um, it's just, it's just weird, you know, it's like, not saying it's good, I'm just saying like, you know, the Spaniards are in no position to pretend that they're better. Crusade does not equal human sacrifice? What? No, 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 no. You need to, you need to read up on, on like the, the history of like Christian martyrdom and like religious warfare. The, the warfare and the killings, the, the slaughter of, of civilians, the burning of villages, the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who were killed, these were viewed as conquests in the name of God. They weren't just, like, petty, like, civil conflicts. Like, there were, there were entire genocides committed, like, to the glory of God. Um, what is that if not, like, massacre on an industrial, or, like, sacrifice on an industrial scale? If, if there's any difference between that and, like, a human sacrifice on an altar, I fail to see how it's meaningful in, like, a utilitarian fashion. Anyway, they fought a bunch. The, um... The Spanish wrote in their own records they tried to split children with their broadswords because they were Indians. Yeah, but they didn't do it on an altar, so it's okay. Uh, anyway, they fled. Cortez lost uh, a lot of people. Spaniards flee. And then, the real game changer. The Aztecs were struck by a smallpox plague, which lasted 70 days. Many were killed, including their new leader, the Emperor um, Quit uh, Quitlahac. It's cool how, like, it's cool how thanks to smallpox and shit, the, 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 the Spanish were literally like angels of death. You know what I mean? Like, you could write about them in biblical terms, you know? They, they arrive, they use deceit to obtain power, and then, like, like, slaughter the nobility and run, and they bring with them plague. Like, it's like a whole fucking thing, you know? Did the Spanish get any cool diseases? Nah, we had plagues, they didn't. We, we have been blessed by Nurgle. It's like Death Guard, yeah. Listen, okay, this is, it's, it's just part of the great chaos conflict, all right? The Spaniards had the blessing of Nurgle, and the Aztecs had the blessing of Korn. Uh, actually, that's, that's not entirely wrong. Uh, and, and this time, the, uh, the, the Papa wins. Didn't they bring back syphilis? Well, that doesn't really end civilization. Did, did syphilis come from here? Uh, whatever, whatever. Uh, anyway. Despite stubborn Aztec resistance organized by their new emperor, the cousin of Moctezuma II, Tenochtitlan and Tlaloco fell on the 13th of August, during which the emperor was captured trying to escape the city in canoe. Boo! You don't get to be emperor of a, of a, of a war Aztec empire. You have to die in battle. Nah, sorry, that's an Aztec thing. You gotta die in battle. You can't escape in a canoe. Largely because he wanted to present the city to his king and emperor, Cortes had made several attempts to end the siege through diplomacy, but all offers were rejected. During the battle, the defenders cut the beating hearts from 70 Spanish pr prisoners of war at the altar to Quetzalcoatl, an act that infuriated the Spaniards. Cortes then ordered the idols of the Aztec gods in the temples to be taken down and replaced with icons of Christianity. He announced the temple would never again be used for human sacrifice. 
Human sacrifice and reports of cannibalism common among the natives of, of the Aztec Empire had been a major reason motivating Cortez and encouraging his soldiers to avoid surrender while fighting to the death. Tenochtitlan had been almost totally destroyed, and the manpower of the Taxcalans plus fire and cannon fire during the siege, once it finally fell, the Spanish continued its destruction as they soon began to establish the foundations of what would become <sighs> Mexico City. The surviving Aztec people were forbidden to live in Tenochtitlan and the surrounding isles and were banished to live in Tatiloco. Conquistador Bernal Diaz de Castillo seemed remorseful after the sacking of Tenochtitlan. He said later in his book, The True History of the Conquest of New Spain, that the natives had showered them with gifts and given them rooms and food. He was dazzled by the gardens and the canals that flowed around the city. When I beheld the scenes around me, said Diaz, I thought within myself this was the garden of the world. All the wonders I beheld that day, nothing now remains. All is overthrown and lost. So that's not good. Why didn't we give the Aztecs any Himars? Yeah. Time traveling back to 1516 to give the Incan Empire and the Aztec Empire uh, 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 Himars and, uh, <laughs> and javelins. And vaccines, yeah. Aztecs under Spanish rule. Ah, it's a whole thing. You should read about the actual fall of Tenochtitlan. There were mass rapes of Aztec civilians by the Spanish and their indigenous allies. It was brutal behind comprehension. Yeah, I kind of figured that. I mean, it's Spanish conquest. And the uh, the Spanish were mad because the Aztecs were putting up a fight. Yeah, it's, it's it tracks, you know. Most, like, a ton of the politics in modern-day Latin America can be explained by the Spanish uh, colonization. That's the reason why in so many instances throughout, like, Latin American history, you can see political divides. And it's like, why is two-thirds of this country brown, one-third white, and the white people have all the money and power, and also sound really suspiciously like Christian conservative Western Europeans, you know? Funnily enough, modern-day Spaniards are, like, more progressive than the remnants of their colonization in Latin America are. They literally had a race system. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know. Spain is pretty good with LGBT rights, yeah. I'm simplifying, of course. Spain is a literal fascist state. Uh, not, not currently. Uh, not, not, not at present, I don't think, but, you know. Casta. A term that means lineage, historically been used as a racial and social identifier in the context of the Spanish Empire, it refers to a now discredited 20th century theoretical framework which po postulated that colonial society operated under a hierarchical race based caste system. Yeah. This is where you hear like mestizo, mulatto, like this is where these terms come from. Yeah. Categories of mixed race. Look at this map of LGBT rights and look at South America. Worldwide, worldwide laws regarding same-sex intercourse, unions, and expression. Oh, that's quite nice. Could be worse. Venezuela needs to catch up, I suppose. Um, the dark blue is the good one. You know, We'll lose it soon. Soon America will be like a light blue on this map. Anyway, wasn't this all interesting? We're going to get to Iran now? Yeah, the only reason I allowed this stun lock to go on for so long is because I felt like it was in line with the general attitude of a research stream, you know? Uh, it felt, uh, you know, it didn't feel like, a, like a, a, a divergence from the intention. This video explains how they translated. I'm going to look through the videos that I was linked, and then I'm going to quickly catch up on a decent number of donos, and then we're going to get to Iran. We'll have enough time for it, don't worry. Did you know the Spanish Empire literally uh, invented modern racism? I mean, yeah, they were the, one of the big architects. One of the few places in the world that actually had worse um, uh, chattel slavery than America was in parts of Latin America. Um, I think this had to do with the nature of the crop cycles, something having to do with the way that like cocoa is farmed. It's complicated. I don't remember. Yeah, in parts of Brazil where like, I, I think it was like more or less in America, like, Obviously, they would rape and kill slaves all the time, but generally, you wanted your slaves to, like, live. Sort, like, 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 whatever can be said about American chattel slavery, broadly, there was a general desire for slaves to live so they could keep being slaves. However, in parts of Brazil, that incentive did not exist. It was like a human thresher, literally. Apparently the working conditions were so bad that people would be broken down after a couple months or years of work, and there wasn't really a way to avoid it. So they were just like, yeah, we'll just bring more slaves then. 
tens of thousands died, hundreds of thousands. Yeah, it was, it was, it was literally like, it was like the, I, it, I think like you could argue it was maybe like the actual worst working conditions possible, like possible. Like it, it was as bad almost as it can get. Brazil was the last country in the West to abolish slavery in 1888. Jesus. Yeah. I, I don't want to do like an oppression Olympics or whatever. Were the Aztec rulers considered god kings by the people? Uh, no. No. The the Aztec rulers were, were envoys of gods, but they were not themselves the gods. They're polytheistic religion. They were they were uh they were not god kings. Um they were yeah, warrior priest leaders, basically. Only 10% of African slaves were sent to America because so many were sent to the Caribbean and Brazil and they needed to be replaced. Yeah, that's not good. Slavery in Brazil began long after. Brazil imported more enslaved Africans than any other country in the world. An estimated 5 million enslaved people from Africa were imported during this time. Gold, diamond, sugar... Brazil was the last country in the Western world to abolish the enslavement of human beings. It's a, it's a whole thing. There are letters by the English telling the Portuguese to calm the fuck down with the slave trade. Yeah. All right, hold on. There were a couple of videos I wanted to peek at really quick. This one's only two minutes. When European sailors reached the New World, they soon came across the native peoples there. And these people had no idea of a Europe existing, let alone any idea of how to speak to a person from there. But as you'll know, contact was made, and in many cases, complicated arrangements were negotiated I hate this art style. between Europeans and natives. But given that there were no interpreters- Okay, I'm not, making, I'm not making any statements about this channel at all. I'm only saying, like, when I, when I talk about the value of researching these civilizations, this is what I mean, I guess. Because from this image, I would think, like, the Aztecs were savages, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, they did wear loincloth stuff, but, like, if you take a look at, like, like drawings and paintings of them at the time, like, they were in rich regalia. You know what I mean? So, like, the in, th just the, the off-the-cuff impression one might have is, like, oh, yeah, of course, it's, like, tribesmen or whatever. These aren't Aztecs, those are Taino. You know, I get that, but is that a distinction you think the average person would make? Do you think that I knew what the fuck the Taino were before, like, 24 hours ago I started doing a bunch of Googling and stuff? That's what I mean. It's, like... What impression do you get? Or, like, what ideas do you have about... You know what I mean? Yeah. Natives. But given that there were no interpreters when Europeans first arrived, this raises a question. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with this YouTube video. Yeah, but you're not really up in world knowledge. Okay, I don't think the average person knows about, like, the Taino people or, like, the specific dress styles of the Aztec Empire. You know, okay, all right, okay, all right, okay. And no, the pictures you show were not of average people. No, yeah, because I showed the fucking king. But hold on. If you look up Aztec fashion, uh, why are you guys pushing back on me on this? I feel like what I'm saying is pretty straightforward. If you take a look at Aztec fashion here, like, um, I, I, guess, I guess the only point that I'm making is that, like, I think for a lot of people, including myself, I'm not leaving myself out of this, if they think, like, Oh yeah, what were the natives in the Americas like? It's like, oh yeah, loincloths. And it's like, well, they had a fucking civilization, right? Look, look at the wacky, cool shit. Look at this shit. He's wearing a loincloth, but it's like, dope. A lot of colorful clothing on the Aztecs. Very drippy. Very Jojo. They love their capes. I love their capes. I'm in favor of their capes. Why can't we walk around these days in a cape and loincloth with a gigantic wine goblet or whatever drink this is? We need to return. Loincloths seem cold to me. Must be a warm area thing. I mean, it was in Mexico, so, you know. Yeah, fucking globalism. How did they communicate? How did European explorers talk to natives? So, generally speaking, when a culture makes contact with another, there's normally people along the way who can be used as interpreters. When colonised in Africa, Europeans would often bring Arabic-speaking peoples with them to translate. This was because sea trade had linked North Africa with the South for centuries, and in the larger kingdoms there would be people at ports who could speak Arabic. 
However, with the Atlantic Ocean and those living on the other side of it, there was none of that. So how did, say, Christopher Columbus communicate with the natives he met on Hispaniola when he arrived there in 1492? Well, for this, they used the only correct form of communication. They used signs. Now, this was mostly sign language, like pointing to things and saying its name or acting something out and then saying the word for it. But they would also make crude drawings as things became more complicated. This covered most of the basics, like food, shelter, Jesus, gold, and boats, but any complicated discussions would require a full <laughs> translator. The, yeah, this is, this is why the, the, the Mexicans were like, oh yeah, Jesus Christ? What a cool new god. We'll add him next to the 73 other altars that we have. <laughs> He's like, no, this is the only god. It's, this is, the god is all. The god is heaven and the earth. And they're, they're just like smiling blankly, you know? Later. And since it would be pretty difficult to ask a native using a sign if they'd like to get on this ship and head back to Spain over an ocean for an immersive crash course in Spanish so he can act as the translator in the future for us, they settled for another option. Kidnap. Unfortunately for Columbus and the natives he'd taken, they didn't survive very long because disease. So how did this change long term? Well, after this, the Spanish would capture natives and they'd keep them in the region to learn the language so there was less dying. Another way was that some Spanish ships became shipwrecked and those who survived would be taken as slaves by the natives and would soon learn their languages and could act as interpreters on behalf of the Native American rulers. And once Spaniards and natives knew one or two languages, the rest was fairly simple, since it simply meant stringing translators together to communicate. And it was after this short period that communication just became the same as it was anywhere else in the world. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Interesting. That makes sense. Okay. We're not going to watch this entire thing, but I want to get a vibe for it. Zan linked it. It was a real food paradise. This still is one of the best examples of how humans can thrive with nature. Islands and peninsulas that are known as the Chinampas. These Chinampas covered the lakes and provided food for the capital city in a maze of canals and raised gardens. When the Spanish conquered Tenochtitlan in 1521, they began to systematically destroy the city and the intricate waterworks that included the Chinampas. Mexico City grew over the ruins of Tenochtitlan and has steadily expanded over the last 500 years. You know, T T Tenochtitlan, they, the Aztecs made artificial islands. They did the fucking Dubai thing. Like, they would actually ship bajillions of pounds of dirt to make artificial islands that they could build on um, out into the, um, the water. Draining and covering the lakes and paving over the chinampas that once covered the wet valley. This vast Wee. ancient farming system has been all but erased from history. Yes, but Vosh, do they have a sewer system? Um, although the Aztecs had no citywide drainage system, much of the wastewater ended up in the lakes surrounding the city. They had a system to handle human waste by means of privies in all public places and many private dwellings from which excrement was collected in canoes. The excrement was applied as fertilizers to the chinapas. Oh, that's what we're learning about now. Or sold in the market to be used for tanning animal hides. Okay, so their system was the poop man would ride it would 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 paddle a canoe between the sh the shit pipes underneath the the buildings and would collect it on his poo boat and would bring it to market which honestly is also very similar to how dubai works except for one special area Apparently, Tenochtitlan was healthier than many European cities at the time, though, even though it was pre-industrialization because of the, um, like, more widespread open-air, like, city construction planning and the fact that people were generally healthier because um, they, they practiced personal hygiene, which Europeans kind of struggled with a little bit. So these are the sediments that we have on the bottom of the lake mixed with plants with god damn look at this mud dude this is like this this looks like prime farming like look at this i want to eat it yeah Roots with trees so that it becomes not only black but it has the right texture you don't need this of the canal sponge of organic material then using buckets or oh that's right because um, they didn't have uh, livestock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Europeans would like sleep with their fucking goats in the room and shit. Um, and we get all the animal diseases. But the Aztecs didn't... Hold on. Aztec domestication. Do they have any... 
any animals that they domesticated? The dog, the turkey, and the duck. Okay. Can't can't really can't really like pull carts with those. I guess you can with with enough dogs, but that's not very. The Aztecs didn't even have the wheel. Um, no, no, the Aztecs were aware of wheels, uh, because they had toys that had wheels, but they didn't use it for anything else. I think the I think wheels just become less useful when you don't have um, like cattle. If you think about what wheels were used for in Europe, it was all like wagons and carts and stuff, and they were pulled by horses. That was like the thing they did with that, you know? Uh, without that, you just have a human pulling a cart. And I can imagine like, if you're, if it's just like human powered, I can understand how they might prefer systems of just having humans literally fucking carry it. Yeah, also they lived on a lake. Tenochtitlan was on a fucking lake. It was on an island. Yeah, Philly boy, it's a lot of fun. Wait, how did Aztecs move heavy objects? How'd they move freight? How did they move, like, canoes? They used canoes. They used boats. Don't need wheels to, to run a boat. The, the Giga Chad Aztec warrior transporting construction materials via canoe versus the Virgin European uh, with a canoe, but with wheels on either side, uh, uh, just struggling to, like, roll them forward, like a guy in a, a mechanical wheelchair, you know, just sort of spinning water. God damn, though. Look at their naval warfare. How much do you know about Aztec naval warfare? Oh, I see. This was them, this was them attacking Spanish boats? Oh, wait, I don't know how realistic this is. Spanish boats did not look like this. Who made this? Let me see if I can find a more historically. Why is this so grainy? This looks dope as fuck, though. They might have made inland boats. Okay, this is an actual Aztec wooden canoe. Oh, HD. In a museum. That's dope. Okay, sorry. Long shovels, the lake mud was scooped out and placed in a layer over the organic material. More organic material and more mud could be added as needed to get the Chinampa to the- Vosh, the Spanish built their own boats in order to attack the capital? Oh! So wait, are, are you saying that that drawing might have been more accurate? And because they weren't like, they weren't like Spanish galleys constructed in, in a dock like over in the homeland, but they were rapidly built on the lake? That's interesting. Because that looks real. Like, if that's the case, then yeah, this does look like a really quickly slapped together boat, you know? The idea of a bunch of Spaniards on the far side of the lake, like, hastily putting together a boat as the Aztecs line up their fucking canoe. Jesus Christ. Yeah, these were rowboats. Look, they have the, the rows. They're fucking row smacking each other. All right, now that we know everything about this farming. Aztec death whistle. Oh, Zan linked this saying, like, hearing this from the fucking jungle if you were superstitious. Sure, dude. That's great. Cool. Imagine scaring the literal shit out of my friend while he's on the toilet with this. Cool. Well, we learned lots of interesting stuff today. Is that a whistle? Yeah, it's like some war whistle or some shit. These cops just learn about Aztec death whistle?
the the beating heart of the Aztec warrior lives to this day. <laughs> the, 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 the warrior spirit persists. I'm pretty sure they believe that it housed the souls of those you killed to scream out in torment. That is so fucking metal. Just carrying that shit around. Like, yeah, this is my Aztec death whistle. All the men that I've killed, their souls inhabit it. When I, when I blow into it, they get really angry and scream. It does sound like it, you know? Jesus. Actually, I think they made it from clay. No, they made it from souls. That's real. What the fuck is on your desktop? Nothing. Hey, Vosh, in Colombia, there was a tribe where they just dumped all the gold into a lake because it looked pretty? Fuck yeah, dude. That is the apex of human civilization right there. Imagine being an indigenous tribe and you find a fuck ton of gold because your, your land is just naturally bountiful. And you're just like, this is really shiny. We should honor our lake with it because our lake gives us life. And you just throw the gold into a lake. Fuck yeah, dude. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Honestly, that's metal. It honestly is. Pretty sure the only reason gold was that valuable was just because of how shiny it was. It is very funny to me how gold was, like, objectively useless for anything practical outside of, like, el conducting electricity in the past, like, uh, recently. But, like, for thousands of years, humans have loved gold anyway purely because it's shiny. And that's it. Literally. Everywhere in the world, like, all civilizations everywhere, with, like, no like no practical use we just collectively agreed upon hundreds thousands of different people you know this is good because it's shiny magpie brain yeah and it doesn't rust yeah and it doesn't rust it doesn't it doesn't really degrade it's it's pretty much like a permanent stable metal yeah um but yeah but mostly because it's shiny let's be real if you think that's funny think about how the spanish dumped tons of platinum in the ocean because it was worthless to them they called it unripe gold the the fucking angloid brain right there, dude. Uh, what is this? Oh no, it was that. That's that's French. You know, it's, 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 this this gold. It is the wrong color. Woof! And you just fucking yeet that shit off of. Uh, yeah, this shit's not done ripening yet. Angloids are only English. Did I say angloid? I meant euroid. Sorry. Still French, Lamont. Yeah, I don't really have a Spanish accent. What's platinum good for? Uh, I think it has some mechanical purposes. I don't, I don't know that much, though. Okay, okay, we, we have to stop. We, this is supposed to be about Iran. Okay, we now know lots of stuff, kind of, about um, Mesoamerica, okay? We're going to read some donos, and then we're going to go to Iran, all right? We're going to learn lots of stuff.